Al Jahid was one of the first Muslim scholars to actually address this issue of anti black racism, which was um, quite prevalent, unfortunately, in, in the Muslim community. And fighting against like the Arabs in terms of not physically, but like in terms of intellectually, in terms of Arab non Arab culture, where and that's why you got like the book like Fakhr al Sudan, where he's celebrating some of the maligned people, the marginalized people, like black Africans. And he's, but he wasn't speaking about it from an, an, an apologetic st standpoint, he was very forthright in his views and he was defending. Um, black people's defending Africans and talking about the contributions, like I said, that black people have made in world history. And he was also, he was quite an antagonistic character as well because he was also, um, like even the name of his book, Fakhr al Sudan al Al Bidan, um, how would you translate it? The boast of black people over white people. Um, and some people translated it as the superiority of black people over white people or the glory of black people over white people. But it's a very provocative title. Um, and even there's some parts of the book is, um, quite provocative because he talks about how black people are better than Arabs in, in different in different things in terms of their qualities and the beauty of black women and things like that because like I said he was living in a period where he was although he was an intellectual though he was a great scholar and I think respected amongst his peers he was still ridiculed for his appearance um maybe also due to him being obviously dark dark in complexion as well as obviously um having like um bulging eyes um, and he was ridiculed for that so he used a lot of wit and humor to address his contemporaries and also talk about like this whole idea that black people are inferior to arabs so he was a Mu'tazilite scholar at, um, and they praised him for being um, a zoologist or someone who was they say the forefather of evolution even before charles darwin so that's what he's famous for in the western world First of all, thank you for coming. It's definitely uh, always a pleasure and an honor to have you here. And the topic of Al-Jahid, I know the last time we discussed, we had a discussion such as this one here. We kind of mentioned him a bit, but we didn't get into too much detail. So it's an opportunity to actually introduce some of the audience and listeners to Al-Jahid, his work, his ideas, his legacy, his career, but also to look at some of his social commentary because he is a very fascinating figure in um, the classical time or ancient times that I find personally is often not mentioned or there is very little mention of him in the public sphere. I first came across his name uh, doing just general reading around the Abbasid era, the golden era, and um, also reading one of your books, uh, Eliminated in the Darkness. <coughs> it's mentioned, I believe, in the footnotes. So his name does appear here and there, but it's never in its own right given, you know, uh, the due respect, or you could say admiration, that I believe he deserves. So tell us a bit more about Al-Jahid, and when did you first come across his work? What was your first impression? How did that begin? Yeah, so, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, Al-Jahid, um, well, that's like his nickname. His full name is Abu Uthman Amr bin Bakr al-Kinani al-Basri. Um, so he's famously known as Al-Jahid, referring to... Um, he, some scholars say he had an eye deformity, other scholars say that it's because he's got goggled eyes, so that's what Ajahid means. Um, he was a wonderful, great scholar from, from Iraq, um, of African descent, of Abyssinian descent, and some scholars also say that he had some Arab ancestry as well, so he was like an Afro-Arab scholar um, from the 9th century. Now, I personally came across him whilst I was studying in Egypt, so when I was studying in Al-Azhar, there was a couple of references when we were studying Islamic history. They met Al-Jahid as part of the, the Mu'tazila movement and some of his great works in relation to Arabic um, prose and literature. And then I also, because I was familiar with his works when, because um, I came across a book written by Ibn al-Jawzi, wrote the famous book, Tanwir al-Ghabash, Illuminating the Darkness, where he was he wrote about, um, you could say, the, the anti-black sentiment that was prevalent, unfortunately, in um, in the Muslim community in, in 12th century Baghdad, where Ibn al-Jawzi was from. But then he also, when I was reading a review of that particular book, um, there was a reference to Al-Jahid was one of the first Muslim scholars to actually address this issue of anti-black racism, which was um, quite prevalent, unfortunately, in, in the Muslim community. So I was quite familiar with him, but funny enough, similar to like what you've said, I, I well, my introduction to Ajahid was through his works in, in terms of speaking about um, addressing anti-black racism within the Muslim community. But whenever I would like Google him or when I used to go to the library and try and find some of his works, oftentimes in the Western world, um, they speak about Ajahid as being this great 
intellectual disgrace thinker, uh, um, and they praise him for being um, a zoologist or someone who was, they say, the forefather of evolution even before Charles Darwin. So that's what he's famous for in the Western world. So even today, when a number of Muslims celebrate a jahid, they celebrate him as being a great literary writer who wrote. Um, it's reported over 200 um, works, some say 300, and they often concentrate on his book, Kitab al-Hayawan, which is a book about zoology and another book which indicates some some references to, to evolution. So again, in terms of his social commentary and his issues, and he's um, speaking about like, anti-Black racism and, and even his satire, he, was, he, was, he had a lot of wits as much as being, a, you know, intellect. And a, and a religious um, scholar, he also had some humour as well, and which we'll talk about a little bit later. So I, I, I was, you know, really attracted to his works because he was a black scholar and he spoke about issues um, like black issues that I felt I could kind of relate to. And he was one of the first scholars, like I said, um, that really addressed it, and he inspired many of the later scholars, um, such as Ibn Al um, Jawzi and Al Suyuti, as others, to kind of speak about the contributions of black Muslims in in Islamic history. So. Yeah, my introduction to him was initially by coming across um, Ibn al-Jawzi's work and then not realising that Ibn al-Jawzi wasn't the first. There was a great scholar called Al-Jahid, we're going to talk about a bit more, who actually wrote about um, anti-black anti sentiment, unfortunately, within the Muslim community. But he wasn't speaking about it from an, an, an apologetic st standpoint. He was very forthright in his views. And he was defending um, black people, was defending Africans and talking about the contributions, like I said, that black people have made in world history. And he was also, he was quite an antagonistic character as well, because he was also, um, like even the name of his book, Fakhr al-Sudan al um, how would you translate it? The boast of black people over white people. Um, and some people have translated as a superiority of black people over white people, or the glory of black people over white people. But it's a very provocative title. Um, and even there's some parts of the book is um, quite provocative because he talks about how black people are better than Arabs in, in different in different things in terms of their qualities and um, the beauty of black women and things like that. Because, like I said, he was living in a period where he was, although he was an intellectual, though he was a great scholar, and I think respected amongst his peers, he was still ridiculed for his appearance. Um, maybe also due to him being obviously dark, dark in complexion, as well as obviously um, having like um, bulging eyes. Um, and he was ridiculed for that. So he used a lot of wit and humour to address his contemporaries and also talk about like, this whole idea that black people are inferior to Arabs. He definitely didn't subscribe to that. So, yeah, I, I can speak about Ajahid um, for hours. And again, we'll speak a bit more about him. But again, my introduction to him was um, from the work of Ibn Al. Yes, I think Ajahid, as you mentioned, is very provocative. <coughs> I wouldn't say provocative in the sense because there is... A, I agree, the title is provocative. But I believe he was responding to something that was provoking him. Huh? There were movements at the time in terms of uh, cultural movements, the Persian movements, in terms of the cultural imposition, trying to kind of balance out the Arab influence over their language and culture. And I believe also that you know, some of the books that were written, or some of the things written about concerning the Sunuj, that's a derogatory term, talking of sub-Saharan or certain tribes. Uh, so that book is effectively the way I see it, is a get back, right? It's a get back book. And I don't believe he meant everything in the sense in which he put it forth because it's a dramatic, it's a dramatic form, isn't it? It's not a literary book. He writes a play effectively. So it's like a dramatized, but in that account, very fascinating by the way, he gives historical instances, he gives uh, sociological commentary, he gives certain, uh, I'd even say, uh, mm, anthropologic arguments to back his claim that blacks are better. But again, I think one extreme is balanced by another extreme. So going off that far is because of perhaps what was written uh, towards black people when he came across those books. He actually had to balance the scales. But I find that book an interesting book because it's very seldom mentioned. I don't think there are many English translations, are there? There is, I mean, funny enough, there is one translation that I've come come across. Um, so there's two. The first one is, the tr is translated the superior the superiority of the black race or the superior black race, one of the two. And it was that was a book it was translated by independent publishing, I believe, in 1981. When I was trying to purchase it, because I saw it online um, at the time when I was when I came across Ajahid's work, 
I think they were selling it for like about two thousand pounds, and I was like, "Whoa, that's <laughs> can't afford that." Um, and then there was another translation um, by um, Jim Corvell. So Jim Corvell he translated the um, Fakhr Sudan, and he also translated a number of other um, Jahidis' book in a um, anthology called Sobriety and Murph. Um, and that's a book where, again, so people are interested in reading um, Fakhr Sudan, and there's other books as well that of Jahid's book that's been translated into English in a book that was compiled and translated by um, Jim Corvell. Um, but they, but again, that's quite an academic book, and I actually came across it whilst I was um, visiting the, um, the School of Oriental and African Studies Library, the University of London, um, because they've got obviously a number of um, of ri ri um, rare books so but in terms of like in main muslim bookshops it hasn't really been true yeah and a lot of people are not really aware of it and i think also one of the reasons and probably i should have explained a bit more about jahid's background and um and the um abbasid period in which he resided just to give people some more context so he was a Mu'tazilite scholar so he was a scholar who followed and just again just for the benefit of people who are listening so Traditionally, um, we have um, four main schools of, of Muslim theology. You have the traditionalist um, school, you have the school which is Ash'ari school, you have the Maturidi school, and then you have the Mu'tazilite school, which is also known as like the rationalist school. And essentially that school is, is the approach that they took was they use more of the intellect as opposed to the transmitted sources and when i mean the transmitted source i'm mainly referring to the hadith in terms of interpreting or understanding the quran and the reason why it's important because oftentimes the mu'tazila are, are maligned by many sunni muslims um obviously nowadays but not really people not really understanding the context in which they arose now again not to make this like a history lesson even though this is a history is so. channel just by way of background so obviously we have the era of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the four rightly guided caliphs that's the golden era that is the real true golden era of islam now we know obviously after um, um ali may allah be pleased with him after he was assassinated Muawiyah became from a sunni perspective he became the the ruler of the or the leader of the muslims and the caliphate um the umayyad caliphate started when Muawiyah became the, the leader and then the city the islamic city of the islamic empire whatever you want to call it moved from medina to damascus in syria that lasted for few decades and then the Abbasid took over and when the Abbasid took over the city moved from um, Damascus in Syria to Baghdad in Iraq now um, Baghdad in Iraq and that um, that was from like around 750 of the common era the Christian era now during that period it's important to understand what differentiates the Umayyad period and the Abbasid period very very high level I'm speaking here the Umayyads were very much about the Arabs and Arab ethnocentrism was something that was quite prevalent amongst a number of the um the leaders and, and, and the people of the time where they looked at it as like as Islam was spreading and they were conquering different lands, they instead of attributing that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a lot of them were attributing it to the to the Arabness. And this 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 case of like this Arab superiority or supremacy started to develop, unfortunately, amongst them, some of the leaders and the peoples of that era. And then Abbasid was seen to be more of embrace non-arabs and that also helped overthrow the, the umayyad and that's why you had movements like the shu'abiyah which is like you say a social political movement which was celebrating the non-arabs particularly the persians over the arabs and similarly you have a jahid as well who's also from the abbasid period again fighting against like the arabs in terms of not physically but like in terms of intellectually in terms of arab non-arab culture where and that's why you got like the book like fakhru sudan where he's celebrating some of the maligned people the marginalized people like black africans um and generally in that period the, the two main ethnic 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 groups you can say in the um in iraq were of, of black people were the habashis from east africa modern day ethiopia eritrea um, Somalia, and then you have the Zanj or the uh, Zanj, what's the plural? Zunj, 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 Zunj. And the Zanj, um, some scholars say it refers to sub Saharan Africans or Bantu speaking Africans or people of modern day, they Tanzania, that, that, that part of the world. So, and during the ninth century, around the era when, um, so although, and I did mention in the beginning that Ajahid was from um, Basra, 
he did he did travel to different parts of the Muslim world, but he mainly resided in 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 Baghdad. And in Baghdad, that was where, like I said, not only was it the capital city of the Muslims, that is where you had it was like the intellectual hub. So when oftentimes a lot of Muslims talk about the Islamic Golden Age, they refer to this era because a lot of the great Muslim thinkers, the, a lot of the Islamic sciences really developed and formulated during this era. And one of the main reasons is because of this, one of the reasons for this was that a number of ancient Greek, Persian, and ancient Indian texts were translated into Arabic. And so you had a number of the scholars, they were coming across the works of Aristotle and other Greek um, theologians and philosophers. And you had a number of the Muslims at that time reading their translated works and also trying to understand, okay, how can we understand this within like an Islamic framework? And then you had, because obviously the ancient Greek approach and also a number of Jewish and Christian people becoming Muslims as well. And then you also had a number of people who were fabricating prophetic traditions, fabricating hadiths and tribute, attributed them to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So because of, again, it's important to understand the context in which Jahid um, was living in. So you had a number of, like I said, um, fabricated hadiths in relation to theology. You had a number of like fables, number of stories. So his approach was more or less like, I'm not really similar to a lot of the Muqtazi, like I can't really trust a lot of these sources. I'm going to really try and use my intellect to understand um, the sacred law to understand any a lot of type of issues rather than just re um, relying on like uh, this particular hadith because again like I said there was a number of hadiths that were unreliable or fabricated so again it's just I think it's whilst obviously I'm a Sunni Muslim um, I, I think it's important that we understand what where scholars such as Jahid and other like great Muslim um, philosophers like Ibn Sina and the like where they were coming from because I think oftentimes it's very easy to for people to malign and say how can they you know reject the hadith and it's not as straightforward as that because obviously having a good opinion of, of these scholars um, that many Sunni scholars also benefited from so it's not as, as, as if like you know we've got great scholars like Ajahid and no one from the Muslim world that later on benefited many of the Muslim scholars our great Sunni scholars read his works and benefited from it. Again, in terms of his approach towards um, theology, they didn't really take follow follow his stance. But a lot of his other works and his other contributions, because he was a master of many Islamic sciences, they benefited from him. But he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. And I think one of the reasons is because I think a lot of Muslims are probably worried that if they were to attribute like some of their ideas to a Jahid, people will think that you're advocating for Mu'tazila. I think that's one of I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of his works isn't outwardly um, acknowledged. To be honest with you, but you do find, like even in um, Imam Asyuti's work, and he's a scholar from Egypt from the 15th century, he references Ajahid, and some other later scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah reference Ajahid, but not necessarily by name. So again, I understand. I think I understand the reason why, if if in terms of maybe they didn't want to, in a sense appear to advocate for a Mu'tazilite, but the same way Muslims benefited from ancient Greeks, um, like Aristotle and the likes, the same way Muslims benefited from ancient Indians. Also, there was Sunni Muslim scholars who benefited from um, Mu'tazilite scholars and Shia scholars as well, which again, might be controversial to say, but that's the duality. And I think because there were a lot of the scholars of the classical era, they respected scholarship, they respected um, they respected um, intellectual arguments. And one of the things I think is lost with many of Muslims nowadays is this is we hold on to like a particular movement or group and think that all, all, all truth or all knowledge just has to come from people within our group. And I don't think that was the approach of many of the scholars of the past. And a number of the scholars would refer to a hadith. I know there's some debate in terms of its um, authenticity, where the Prophet, peace be upon him, was reported to have said that seek knowledge um and um, knowledge is the lost property of the, of the believer you know so take it wherever you find it so this idea that as muslims and there's a there's a saying it's not a hadith that seek knowledge even if it's as far as as, as china meaning that as one well, nowadays we might say timbuktu they say but the, the whole idea is that you shouldn't be afraid to seek knowledge and to learn because you never know the truth can come from anyone's tongue you know, and that's something, and, and because maybe there might be some ideas or beliefs of a particular individual that you might disagree with, it doesn't mean they haven't got other things that you can benefit from. And I think that was the, that was what Baghdad was like. 
And it's important, again, for people to really understand and appreciate that, because even when we look at our fit tradition, our legal tr tradition, you see the difference between scholars who lived in like Baghdad, which, which was a metropolitan society with people of different religions as well. You had Muslims, you had Christians, you had Jews, you had Zoroastrians, and, you, and then you compare that to the culture in Medina with Imam Malik, which was, you could say, very majority Muslim, if not 99% Muslim. So even the fiqh that came out of it was very different to like the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa. And because again, they are, they are, they are receiving many new issues and, and then even their approach of the scholars of that period was sometimes to hypothesize that, okay, if this were to happen, what would be your ruling? And that approach is something very different from what Imam Malik, because it was like, unless something has happened, I'll give a legal ruling. Other than that, I don't do, I don't like this speculation. So again, just wanted to give that some of a background so people can understand the environment that a jahid arose from. And again, this was very, you know, it was this cultural exchange or this intellectual exchange from people that followed different interpretations. Because again, I think all of the scholars, whether they were traditionalists, whether they were Ash'aris, Maturudis, Murat'az, like they all wanted to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they had different interpretations in terms of what they believed was the soundest approach or and again so that's why i think it's important that people understand that and we don't have to get bogged down into like the theological debates that unfortunately many muslims young muslims kind of get caught up into nowadays um but that aside he a jahid was a curious mind and that's something that i think was quite brilliant about him he wasn't afraid to challenge the status quo he wasn't afraid to well, modern day people now would say speak truth to power, so to speak, because he was, if he saw something or he didn't think something was correct, he would talk about it or he would try to address it in his own way. And a lot of times he would use reasoning. Now, what's quite interesting, what I found him to be a really um, captivating scholar and reading his work was because it was he wasn't just relying on Quran and Hadith. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is because he's speaking to people, he's addressing some people who, are not Muslim. So the same way if you're going to have a debate with someone and someone, for example, is not a Muslim, you're not just going to mention the proofs based on a verse from the Quran or a hadith because they might not believe that they're not Muslim in the first place. Or someone who's maybe a Mu'tazila, he's not just, if, if he's not explicitly stating the Quran, he will use reason, he will try and use logical arguments, not use a report from the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, because like I said, at that period, there was a number of people were skeptical of, of hadith so again his reasoning in terms of the way he would um present his arguments and again some and he would use like i said satire he use humor he'll present arguments that and he says something which is really what well, i found really brilliant where he mentions that um for teachers of ethical um um teachers or if you're teaching like ethics or morals you should use a bit of humor with your education so it's not just about dry you know, like information, data, you need to, you need to entertain as well, educate someone. And that's why I think many Muslims of today may be quite shocked by some of his writings because it can come across as quite explicit and things like that. But he also does state that even, and again, he was from the third century of the Islamic um, calendar or the ninth century of the common era. He even states that scholars of the past or the companions of the past, they had more of a, um, it wasn't as prudish, shall we say, as even the, the, the scholars of his era, of the ninth century. So it just shows that attitudes did change even in early Islam, as much as we like to, and I think again, as much as we like to romanticize Islamic history or think that all of the scholars were one way, there was different scholars who had different tolerance levels, had different um, characteristics as well and qualities. So I think it's, he, he's, he's one scholar that, to be honest, when I'm reading his work, I feel like I'm seeing, I'm reading a human being, if that makes sense. I'm not just reading data. Whereas a number of scholars, to be fair, it's like, and they're mainly following the traditionalist school, they're just quoting a, a Quranic verse, hadith, um, and then maybe giving it an opinion of this scholar said this, scholar said that. Whereas he was adding his own little spice or his little source, to be honest, to, to his treaties, which you can read. And it was a colourful read, like I said. So that's that's why for me, I'm just surprised maybe that, um, why, he did such, why his work isn't widely um, known amongst Muslims, but then I, again, I think it's because I think Muslims are worried by the more tazer like background. But and that's where I think, okay, maybe if someone is um, relatively young, fair enough, because you, you want to sort of ground them in their Islam and their in their um, aqidah, so to speak. But I think 
for people who are adults and have got a mature mind, I don't think there's anything wrong with educating them about great scholars who had different approaches in terms of teaching Islam. Well, and it wasn't always teaching Islam, just, so it's, it's, it's important that I kind of clarify that. Because we're talking about social issues, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Yeah, he wasn't a unique candidate in that sense, because the state policy of the time uh, was the Mu'tazili creed anyway. So the majority of those scholars who lived in Baghdad were either uh, of that school of thought or at least tolerant of it. So that was an epoch of... I would say the golden age of the rationalists, <clears throat> and he was one of the most preeminent figures in that in that sense. Uh, <clears throat> but his his topic, uh, his his choice of topics is very diverse. From zoology, as you mentioned, Kitab al Hayawan, seven volumes, goes into very great detail. He's you know writing about different species, uh, and that's where we get the idea that he may have been a precursor to Darwin when it comes to the concept of evolution. Um, but also uh, skits or sketches, I guess what we would call today, in terms of uh, caricatures. He would write about uh, quite uh, interesting uh, anecdotes, funny anecdotes, uh, but also social commentary. al fakhr al-Sudan al-Bidan is an interesting book um, for many reasons. But I think, contrary to what you've said, which I don't disagree with, but I think another reason why his works are not highlighted is because there is an, une an unease. He was a very sharp critic, a very sharp and unrelenting cultural critic. He wasn't mincing his words when he said certain things. And uh, whereas today we kind of, we, we touch upon a topic very, very mildly, right? He went for the punch and he didn't pull back. So well, I read through al fakhr certain chapters, certain parts as part of another research. <coughs> so he's quoted in different books of history. And uh, let's, I'll give an example. When we talk of the Umayyads and when Yazid sends an army to Medina, which eventually becomes the massacre of Harra. I don't call it battle. It's not a battle, it's a massacre of Harra. Uh, Al-Jahid mentions that in Al-Fakhr, right? So you have a group of black people, Sudanese, and a group of white people, Arabs or Persians. And one of the retorts that Al-Jahid puts in the mouth of the blacks towards the white is, <clears throat> what did we do to your women when we entered Medina with our large members, right? In a very crude way. Because there was a rape, there was a mass violation of the women of Medina and the armies coming from uh, Kufa, they had black mercenaries in the army. And so uh, one of the most brutal attacks in terms of touching someone's honor and pride is to talk of their women. And he mentions that in al fakhr right? So it's a very, very direct uh, kind of you could say attack in that sense uh, but having said that i don't consider him a racist as i said before i think he was responding to something that was already if you read the other books you'll understand the levels to which certain commentary can go um, but he was also a very very keen arabist one of the greatest in fact when it comes to arabic literature so he wasn't somebody who hated arabs or arab culture he was at the very epitome of arab uh, literature adab effectively and to some degree, he was a proud Arabist, especially when he spoke against the Persian uh, proponents for their culture. He stood strong when it comes to the Arabic language and culture. So he's a very dynamic figure in that sense. Uh, which part of the uh, Fakhr al-Sudan did you find most interesting? Or any anecdotes from the book that you want to share with us, inshallah? Because it's not a book people are going to be able to get in English. So give us a bit of <laughs> a, few ex a few extracts of that. It was, I was thinking of similar to the passage that you mentioned um, in relation to about women, but I wasn't going to use that one. Um, it, it was um, when he was talking about how, and I think this is obviously, I think really important when he was talking about how, he, and he was, when he was talking about how the Arabs of the past, they had no issue intermarrying with black women, whereas now it's kind of seen as dishonor. And he was trying to talk about how like, a, he was saying that what's happened, like before there was no issue of Arabs, Arabs marrying, you know, black African women and, and black men marrying Arab women, whereas now, again, because of their, their pride, he was saying that now that you look down upon us. And then he said that he said something beautiful where he used the expression and talking about how beauty is basically is about custom. So this idea that Arabs are more beautiful or um, are more attractive than Arabs it's based on custom. So this, and he said the same way we black men don't look at um, white um, as uh, white women, you white men don't look at black women, kind of thing. 
I mean, it's all relative. And I think that's very, very empowering, especially for black people nowadays, where I often come across or find um, people maybe who reach out, especially for black people living in um, as a minority amongst Muslims, thinking, okay, how do they feel, feel a sense of pride or feel, um, see themselves in, in the religion? And I always try to explain to them that I can understand it can be very difficult to see if you're with if you're in a minority, but you shouldn't be seeking validation from someone who maybe who doesn't acknowledge you. And I think that's important. I think that's it's easy for someone to say, or maybe someone doesn't need that message if they're in obviously predominantly um, with black people, because if you appreciate black men will appreciate black women, vice versa. But if you're a minority, where you're seeing a lot of the religious figures, a lot of the scholars who are speaking detriment, speaking ill of or denigrating black people, black culture, or black women, you can buy into it. I think that's what the religion is teaching. And he makes an interesting point, which is which very important that he's talking about. When we talk about beauty, it's relative and it's determined based on culture. And it's important that a scholar says that because you will find, which again, I'm sure you're very familiar with, is that a lot of scholars, for example, the Maliki Madhab will say, given fatwa, saying that white women are more um, attract, not only more attractive, but they are better wives and better to choose as opposed to black women and again someone who's not who doesn't understand the context and I'm, again i'm not making excuses for any of these scholars but someone who doesn't understand the context someone who doesn't understand that this is their opinion might think that this is from islam Inherently, exactly and that's why it's important that you have that counter narrative and that's why i think jahid is great for that because if you read even up until today a number of non-black people who talk about like this issue they just say oh it doesn't matter because even though she was black, she was a she was she was a pious lady. So it's this yeah, idea that or, I, or Allah doesn't look at your Allah doesn't look at your figures. That's incidental. It's not important. Mm -hmm. So even though you're not as attractive, but still you've got other qualities that men can find attractive. And it's like, and and for me and I and I and this is something again. I when I when I was looking at at Jahid's approach, like I said in the beginning, he was very unapologetic, and he was someone who again, like I said, he. He wasn't afraid, and again, the story you you mentioned about taking having the women of Medina, black that's men basically, yeah, taking, taking the women of Medina. Medina. Let's, yeah, let's, yeah, let's, this is a counter narrative here. He, I mean, for those who read the Arabic, he's very straight with it, right? And he does it in a mocking way. There's a psychological play. You don't like black men taking your women, but the men in the army of Yazid did so. And he goes on to boast about the manhood of these black men, right? And he, uh, it's interesting because, look, I think when we talk of the ancient classics, we don't expect this kind of literature. Yeah? It's, there is a decorum. <clears throat> there was a level of... Uh, there is a level of... Uh, how do you say that? There is decorum. There's a level of... Uh, there's a level of, not, I wouldn't say respect, there's just, we don't expect it from that earlier generation. But it is important to, again, one, another thing I want to make very clear is that Al Jahid was living at a time, literally when he died in A69, one year later, the greatest revolution, the racial, the greatest race based revolution in Islamic history sparked off the Zanja revolt, right? And it sparked off in the same region. So it wasn't coincidental that. He's writing about these topics in such a way, as I said, one extreme invites another extreme. And then the, the year he dies, you have the greatest, the most bloody revolution, the Zanj revolt, the revolt of the blacks effectively in Abbas and Baghdad. And many people lost their lives. So he wasn't writing in a vacuum effectively. And if you look at the way, I mean, he goes to very, I would say extreme, but he goes to lengths to empower those around him who were looked down upon by talking of the, the uh, uh, you could say, the advantage of being a black person. Something that I believe in modern settings, people consider dangerous or threatening, right? Which is one of the reasons why it may not be a popular topic, but I think it's an essential read. We need to read this because in the same way, somebody who is not black may read that and feel offended or feel uneasy. Imagine being a black person and reading the works of various non-black scholars saying pretty much worse than that, but they mean it. I mean, in this, in this sense, he's a bit of a satirist, right? It's satirical. It's not literally what is happening. He's using satire, but reading books of fiction, for example, and when they actually mean it, I want you to imagine how that feels on the other side. So 
this book is an essential book to have in, in terms of we need it in our catalogue of literature because without of it, the extreme that goes this way is not balanced, it's not counted. So, and there are many other things, you know, he talks of uh, some of the, what you'd call today in modern terms, a bit of token um, uh, cliches. Blacks are better at dancing, <laughs> blacks are better rhythm, uh, better voices, but also he says they are more eloquent. Yeah? So he talks of the eloquence of black people, the patience of black people. So I think it is a book that should be put on the scales when we talk of the wider narrative, because without it, again, I think the scales are a bit light on this side. No, I, I agree with you entirely. I think one of the things that I found from listening to non-black people who talk about that book, they will either say that it's just a book of satire, he doesn't mean that. Or they will say, or they, will, they won't really talk about what he was getting at. And I just, and, and, and what I find troubling is that, well, not even troubling, right, troubling, but I think this is where it's, I think it's even more important, not only the book itself, but the people that are teaching it do justice to where he was coming from. And in, I'm not saying only black people can teach it, but I think they can relate to where he was coming from. But I've read so many, um, I've read so many um, academics, intellectuals, who written reviews speaking and they just talk about it from a sense of oh we're just talking about anti-black racism mm. and not connecting like what you mentioned about the year that he died you had the same year the zandra revolt. it's not a coincidence it's not a coincidence at all. like i said it's not a coincidence now again i think for whatever reason a number of non-black intellectuals academics teachers aren't able to connect those two dots like i just find it really bizarre on, on, honestly and the people that i find Blaming it, interestingly enough, are pan Africanist non Muslims. And that's, that's where it gets a bit complicated. complicated. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So this is, yeah, yeah. sorry. So God. it gets a bit complicated because, because yeah. I've, I've seen, seen some, some translations. translations. I don't count them all the translations, by the way. I've, I've seen, seen some, some translations, translations that are written by people of that uh, perspective who are not Muslim, but they have uh, a pro. Pro black is not a bad thing, right? But in that context, it is not a good thing either, in the extreme sense, right? And they will use al jahid as ammunition, intellectual ammunition. And at that point, I would say, we need to step back a bit here because now it can be a bit dangerous. Yeah? He does utilize comedy, satire, humor as a softening agent, something very difficult to discuss. He uses satire and humor. And it is quite funny, actually. I mean. I wish we had time to go into it. The way he sets up the scene of black people here, white people there. They're hurling insults towards the blacks. They're hurling insults back. And then it gets historical at one point. It gets social at one point. It's a fascinating work. It's a tremendous work, honestly. But I feel that there is, there are fault lines that if it isn't uh, interpreted properly, it can fall either way. As you said, it can, it can either be dismissed as just being a, a comedy skit, right? He didn't mean anything. In fact, there is there is a tendency to uh, to make it a satire against black people. In that, he wrote this not to empower blacks, but it's it was almost like a, it's almost like seeing somebody who is uh, disabled in some sense. You make fun of the disability, as in oh, he's faster than somebody who can run. But in a way, it's almost denigrating them because you make you're poking fun even more at what they have as a disadvantage. So that's one perspective. But at the same time, you can take it ultra-literalistically to be literal with it. And that goes a completely different direction. So the balance is in between where you can see both. But I find, I find him interesting for that reason. He's atypical of that genre. He's atypical. Much like Ibn Hazm. Ibn Hazm was also atypical, right? He, was a, he wasn't a Mu'tazili, but he was a Zahiri, which is another, you know, it's not a mainstream Sunni, but it is a bit off the scales, but he was different in that how he spoke of things, how he wrote things was very, very, very uh, captivating. So tell us a bit more about his social commentary, actually, because you mentioned a bit about Tell us about his social commentary pertaining to maybe relationships, women. A female slave can become um, the, sexual, the legitimate sexual partner of a man. Was he once he owns her? Now what? Now because of this, you had some some men who had like literally hundreds, if not thousands, of female slaves or female con or, or con concubines that they can have relations with. Now, of course, we know in Islamic law, obviously, a man is only allowed to have up to four wives. But in terms of concubines, it's unlimited. Now they weren't 
and during the period of the Abbasid period, it wasn't like the period of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him or the four rightly guided caliphs where there wasn't like this ridiculous supply of like enslaved people. So we're now in a new stratosphere altogether. And what you had is a number of the Muslims, and this is what Ajahid was speaking about, they started to prefer slave women over even their own wives. Really? The reason being is because Muslim women who are free, they have to wear the hijab. So you cover their body, cover their hair. Whereas if you're an enslaved woman, you don't have to wear the hijab. In, in, fact, in fact, you're not supposed to fully cover, you're not supposed to wear the jilbab like a free woman. And there's reports, I know that some Muslims might be shocked by this, but there's even reports that Umar bin Khattab um, rebuked a, a slave woman who was dressing like a free woman and told her that you shouldn't be wearing the jilbab like a free woman. The hijab is legislated for, um, for a, a free woman. And again, I know Muslims, again, might be shocked by this because we have this idea, or many people have this idea that um, all of the women, even non-Muslim women, were fully covered. That was not the case. Um, so you had in like in Medina, um, a great scholar called Abdul Malik ibn Habib, who was a 9th century scholar, an Andalusian scholar who wrote a book called Adab nisa He spoke about when he went to Medina, um, and he was just around the period of Ajahid as well. He spoke about when he went to Medina, he was shocked at the amount of beautiful women wasn't even covered like in terms of they were bare chested and he spoke about this in the, in the ninth century similarly you had imam malik prior to him he spoke about and he was troubled even, although he knew that it wasn't required by islamic law for the women to cover their chest he just asked the governor to try and make it like Sorry, enforce it chest, what does that mean As their breasts their, their breasts yeah they were bare chested so they their hair was out because they, they wasn't required cleavage and stuff like that yeah they could not the, the cleavage their breast was out so it's important yeah. that people understand this because and sorry, 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 brother. We need to stop here. Let's stop here. <laughs> you mean to tell me that in the ninth century, in Medina, not London, not Paris, there were women who had hair out, and you could see the breasts effectively in Medina. Is that what we're saying here? And Islamically speaking, the law does not cry for them to cover that up because they're not Muslim. Is that am I misunderstanding what you've said, or is that? No, the law doesn't require to cover them up, even the Muslims.